What a lovely day! Welcome to Flat Earth Debate Uncut and After Show. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification icon to keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you'd like to support the channel there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they premiere and there's also a PayPal, Patreon and crypto link in the info box below the video. Speaking of Patreon, I'm going to do a quick shout out to all of you who do support me on Patreon so a massive shout out of appreciation to Green baby me. Abraham Mohammed, Adrian Quintana, Alistair Main, Blue Ridge Ranger, Burn Fat Till My Stomach Is As Flat As The Earth, Chris Hillman, Dank, Dave Rackier Gaffer, David Robinson, David Wayne Foster, Dicker, Skeptic Edwin Johnson, Owen Jennisons, Felix Hung, Fireball X, God Rockin, Henrik 86, Joshua Balsimo, Kirsten Smith, Liam Nedrick, Life Is Short, Maria Neeland, Missouri Bear, Muted, NA Literalist, Nathan Thompson, Nyby, Rob H, Skeptic 936, Steve ALM, Texas Mike, the Flat Earth Channel.com, The Real Gabster, Tina Baker, Unbelievable Productions, and Windrider. So a massive shout out of thanks and appreciation to all of you for supporting me on Patreon. Now we are joined by at least a couple of people in Discord, so I'll raise the mic on them and you can enjoy their dulcet tones while I set up for today's live show. It's um Bev. And like we have spend quite a lot of time over there just chatting and shooting the breeze and we've got um a thing that we're starting up with like um you remember top trumps cards yeah yeah we're um having a, a like a a two versus two ultimate um kind of debate team tag team if you like and we'd just like to know who you're um, top two debating people would be you can't have yourself because you would be like a substitute the third person on that team I mean, and we just wondered if you'd give some input and give us your top two debaters Koshal picked himself. Sorry, Scott, I missed most of that because there was a uh, there's a, a lot of noise here this second. Typically before the show goes live, there's things being sorted out, so I didn't hear most of that. I'm really sorry. They're picking the top two debaters from the globe side and flat earth side on MS Channel. Oh, he's, he's actually got an issue. He's, he's dropped, so I think he might have an issue. We're not recording yet, are we? Yeah, as soon as I'm as soon as I'm talking, I'm recording. <laughs> All right, then I won't say mine. Yep, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> Try to bear that in mind. <laughs> gotcha. Well, between you and I, we both know that there are moments when you ask that question and I say no. So, yeah, it's a perfectly reasonable question. It just seems that way because obviously this is being recorded. Somebody is going to be listening to that and it seems to the listener right. absurd. It isn't. 
because there are obviously times I'm not recording. It was torture listening to Zanuck on 24-7 yesterday. Oh, my God. How is that new section going at 247? Yeah. You're ch oh, did you hear me? You were chopping. I caught the last part of what you said. I said, how is that new section at 247? It seems like they're allowing the veteran ballers back, but only for this new section. So... Oh, I don't How know. did that go? Were you listening there? Yeah, I I was just on a live stream. I didn't know they had had a separate thing. What, what is that? What you saying? Yeah, it's a separate uh, section at two four seven, and this is to allow the Breton ballers back. And oh. otherwise, like some, because they don't want to. They want to be mostly focusing on teaching new people to the to the scene and I'll just leave it at that so that kind of doesn't leave much room for the veteran ballers anymore right but now that they created this new section it seems like this is like a way to get the veteran ballers back in there for people who do want to talk to the more experienced ballers yeah well they were allowing him to do so much with Coriolis they were allowing him to freaking, you know, you know how Nathan stops him from just adding the speed of the earth to his plane. They were just allowing him to do that. And right, I'm like, but... shouldn't you have to prove the earth is spinning first before you give him the speed of the earth? All right. Well, that's fine. And that's your opinion. But like. How Nathan runs his show here is how he runs his show here, and he's entitled to it. And how they run their show at 247 is their authority to do it how they want there. So oh, there's a little is, bit of a... That, is anybody everybody's talking got different to taste. Like, why do you What's not that? pick that up? It's it, you, you, The guy's talking about the spin of the earth without proving it. Well, sometimes it's like at? Sleeping Warrior, how he says, uh, I'll let them beg the question and all this every now and then, because... You got to think about it. If you're on a Discord server and you're there talking a lot, you want a little bit more variety in the discussions, right? And allowing them to beg the question kind of, you know. Yeah, I guess I got. I guess I got used to Nathan then, because I hear you. And the, it's, the stuff it's that fine. he was allowed to. Yeah, it's fine. It's, there's a, like I said. Uh, but let me a tell you, variety, though, right? The way Satan, confused. I mean, not, <laughs> the way Nathan does it is, uh, you know, variety in itself. It's different from others. So. No, but what can happen <laughs> though when you start allowing that? He had people scratching their heads, all confused. Even OJ was <laughs> like, oh, "Oh, yeah, now I get what you're saying." But he didn't get what he was saying because he was talking in circles. That's why they have a separate section so that they don't confuse the new guys. He wasn't, OJ's not a new guy. Good morning. Good morning, Tenth Man. Good morning, Tenth. Um, is, is DP here? He, uh, is that, yeah, yeah. All right, Tenth, how you doing? Okay, DP, how you doing? Why don't you share with Nathan what uh, we talked about yesterday? Um, How would I do that on Google Hangouts? You would... Um, Go to Master B and post it no, there. No, let me tell you. Or, if, if, do, do you want to share something that was on your screen? Uh, no, I just post some like screenshots. Yeah, stick them in. Stick them in Master B, I guess. Stick them in Master B. Yeah, oh, okay. Okay. You, won't, you won't get to does see that, them in the hangout, but do, I'll tell you when they're up that, on screen. Does that cut me out from um, G Plus though? You know what? I can do it. I took screenshots of what you showed, all three of them. You want me to do it? Hang on. What I can do, Temp, then, is I can send them to you in a DM on Discord. Are you logged into Discord? Yeah. Yeah, I'll send them as well. Um... Wait. 
And one, one of you tell us what's what while while this is happening. Um, it's to do with the uh, Wikipedia definition of water level, and I actually discovered yesterday that it's been changed in Wikipedia since um, Bev's been kind of pushing his water level experiment test, call it which which you will. Um, the actual definition on Wikipedia for the water level has changed. Okay, I've got it. Just the one you're going to do? Well, there's, this is the one yeah. that says who changed it and when it was changed. And the last one would be the new definition. All right, let me get them all loaded first then. I'll go back to your... So I got one up there now. Yeah, so the, the first one is the old definition, which is the one that um, yeah. Bevy uses. All right, the other two are popping up. So go ahead and talk to Nathan. I'll post these up and give you a cue when it's up. Well, I'll just highlighting how um, Wikipedia has changed the definition within the, the last couple of weeks when it has become a popular subject within our debate circles, shall we say. Okay. Um, and the it was actually changed on the 30th of May, which was what, only two weeks ago. Okay, I posted the first one up, Nathan. The other two are still mm -hmm. downloading. Uh, a disgrace and totally Okay, so I've got the first one up. Water level device, water levels highlighted. So that is the one that's highlighted in yellow here. Yeah? Yep, so the audience can see that. Right, okay. So if you look at that one, um, it says the... Where is it? The surface of liquid water to establish a horizontal plane of reference. Okay, which is the the definition that we've been we've been going with, and then the where it's been changed. It's it's now says the the surface of liquid water to establish a local horizontal plane of reference. So they've inserted the words local horizontal plane of reference. Second one's up. Okay. I mean, yeah, they've added it because their use of a tangent plane. So they currently Which... use the datums to establish a point on a presupposition of a sphere Earth, and then locally, as they phrase it, they plot it out as flat. <laughs> yeah, which which ties into Temp's man Tenth Man's um disco ball. With the... Actually that's Brian's disco ball. Oh was it Brian's disco ball? Sorry. <laughs> I thought I thought that was your analogy, Tenth. Well it was my it was my era, but it's Brian's ball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I I thought it was just interesting. Like I say, I I, I was just on Wikipedia yesterday. And I thought to myself, well, that definition isn't the same one that Bev is using. And um, it's interesting to, to find out that it's changed within the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I mean, anybody can change Wiki, though, right? Um, I think that's his point. Yeah. <laughs> They're changing it because they need, they need to change to. it now. But what they but so many. What, what the the more the point is that so many people use it as a as kind of a, a be all and end all I see. to prove a point, when in actual fact this actually proves that it isn't that be all and end all to prove a point. If anything, yes. it's it's the complete opposite of that. Third one's up. Gotcha. I've got it on screen now. The revision history level revision history it's the top one 
Engineer 111 on the 30th of May, I think it was. Yeah. I mean, it's a good point because I can't go to Encyclopedia Britannica and make changes on my own, can I, at will? No. Oh, no, Wiki's that has to, has, has to be vetted, doesn't it? Wiki's, like, when people reference it, either, typically, if John's referencing it, he's going to say, well, here's it from your alma mater. In other words, these people that use this as a citation are generally what we call Wiki parroting pretender clowns. Because there often isn't as much substance as you might hope. The level of research, the thorough nature isn't quite there, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Bev's got plenty of qualifications, even if he changed it to the new one. So what? It backs entirely what he's explaining. When the only reason I can explain what that edition of local implies, the only reason that's uh, possible is because of Bev. And his presentation's nice and clear. And he presents it in a nice cohesive way so that I can understand how they've drawn out a, a presupposition and then a tangent plane from that presupposition. You're going to have to pop yourself on mute when you're not talking because you're causing horrendous background noise, by the way. I've got much more limited control over you guys, the trusted guys in the Hangout. <laughs> uh, was, was that for me? Yeah. Nathan, yeah. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, being sorry. subtle. I don't know how to get you too soon. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Bev's done a good job. So, yeah, change wiki all you like and say it's local. Oh, it's only locally flat. Well, it wouldn't be flat in any shape or form if it was a sphere. So, you know, for me, it doesn't change much. There's two, there's two aspects to the surveying that they do. One, assume you're on a sphere. Two, measure it as flat. Well, what else do you need? <laughs> you know. But if they want to Bev think... Was actually... Bev was actually saying that this this definition it it actually helps him with his cause because now they have to define how local is local. The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen uh, TV series British show. Do you remember that? Are you local? Clearly not. <laughs> <laughs> With that punchline in. <laughs> Must be a local show then. A very, very dark British comedy from about 10 years ago. Clearly not well, remembered by a, anybody. They made, <laughs> they, they made a movie out of it. I think Sean Connery was in No. That's like... League of Extraordinary of, Gentlemen. Yeah, yeah. But it's, got, it's, it's based on superheroes and monsters and picture of Dorian Gray and various other things. That's completely different. That's just some Hollywood. Nah, it's not that. But they still made a movie on it. <laughs> With that title. It's set in a little local town called Royce in Vasey. And Royce in Vasey is... Uh, the town in the fiction is named after a chap who's a stage performer, a British stage performer, called Roy Chubby Brown whose actual name is Royce and Vasey. So they've named the town after this very blue uh, comedian from the 80s and 90s. I'm sure he probably does stuff still to this day. But there we go. So it's named after a, a very crude comedian, the town that these local yokels, British local yokels, like, like the American equivalent, popping and cracking on their mic again in G+. <laughs> Who is it this time? <laughs> it could like, be me, I don't know. I'm Probably. just waiting to respond, but I could turn it off. They're uh, the equivalent of rednecks, basically, like yokel locals, we would call them. Gotcha. Hey, just uh, DP, are you done? or? Um, yeah, I think so. That's the only point I wanted to bring to Nathan's attention, really. I, I did say to him about the 2 um, the two plus 2 ultimate debater challenge. Yeah, you already shared that. Uh, well, I said to Nathan about it, but I'm not oh. sure whether he uh, actually followed what I was talking about. Maybe you could follow it up. Okay, I know a little bit about it. I think yeah. there's a poll being taken as to who would be the best two uh, individuals that would argue the side for uh, geocentric flat Earth versus 
uh, a heliocentric space monkey ball religion. There. And uh, so when I popped on Discord yesterday at MI UK and they said, well, who would you pick? I said, well, what's the criteria? And they said, well, the best two you can think of to debate the subject. And I said, oh, that's easy. That's uh, Nathan Oakley and Quantity Racer. Uh, and then I had my second team and, you know, but no, you can only pick one. I said, okay, that's the one then. <laughs> yeah, so who's your two, Nathan? Who's my two oh. best, that I think are the best debaters, if I exclude me? Yeah, you can't include yourself. You've got to exclude yourself for your sub in case one of them doesn't turn up. Who would I pick as the best person to debate somebody else? Um, I'd probably I'd probably put Chocolate Saiyan right up there. Chocolate Saiyan knows his stuff. And he's calm, yeah, I chose cool, him collected. too. Very, very high-level debater. Surprisingly, he's one of those people that says, I never expected to be in this position where I'd be debating or understanding this stuff. So it's always the most unlikely of people that end up being like... I'm often grateful that he's in my corner because he, he often picks up on things that I will miss or highlight a point that hasn't been laboured. Um, so, yeah, I'd say I'd put chocolate right up there. And who's the other one? Uh, I've got to pick two. Uh, okay. Yeah, you're the sub. I'd, pro I'd probably put Tenth Man next to him. Tenth Man is similar to chocolate in the respect that he's cool, calm, collected, knows all the arguments inside out. Really? Okay. I chose I chose my second team was uh, Paul Hall and Chuck. I chose John because he's always got references at his fingertips. Um I chose Nathan because uh provided he can behave, he's he's pretty on point with pretty much everything these days. Nathan Thompson, that is. <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> 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 that was good, really. Sorry, I couldn't help. No, that was perfectly timed. No, that was Comedy is all about timing. That was beautiful. It is. It is. Just have that little <laughs> pause for a minute and then drop it. <laughs> right, well, I'll leave you to it. That was good. I like it debating well, top um, trumps. What's that? Top trumps, basically, isn't it? Yeah, hey, yesterday's show was absolutely great. Um, as the narrative goes, concise on the topic when Rumpus came on, just surgical. I can't wait to hear it today. Uh, I just wanted to shout out that there's many sound bites there from yesterday that you could put into smaller little, you know, bits. About the fact that nobody picked Kosho on the Globe side. I mean, uh, not Kosho, um, Rumpus. What's the What's the list over there? Yeah, who have you got on the other side of the argument? So, who's on the Globe side of the top trumps? Uh, Professor Dave has been chosen <laughs> for some <laughs> unknown reason. Um. I just want to think. Oh, uh, you'll have to. Blue Marble Science. Hold well on. Just before we just dwell on each one. So, I don't know Professor Dave. So, I think the only thing I've ever seen him do was a uh, top 10 something or other, which I responded to. But that is literally all I've ever seen of him. Oh, no. And also, Quantum Eraser did a dissection of something again that I hadn't watched. So, I don't know. Not a professor, though, is he? Isn't that the first problem? Yeah. Yeah, that is the first problem. And the major problem, I would say, from his point of view. Okay. Um, <laughs> so he's up there. Right, fair enough. Okay, who else? Yeah, he, he got picked yesterday. Who else? Um, like I say, Blue Marble Science got okay. picked. I, I, this sounds like we're scraping the bottom of the barrel as opposed to picking the best ones. What's going on? But, but the, <laughs> the thing is, they they haven't chosen any of the, the headliners like um, Lie Man Scam or um, Red Rhetoric or Fight the Fat Earth. They've they've not been picked. It's because they're not in the trenches. Uh, is that all three yes. of them never in the trenches? Simon Dan certainly is never in the trenches, other than in the chat. No, absolutely. So, uh, who else are you saying? Who else was on that list? Simon Dan and who? 
Um, red rhetoric. Red rhetoric. Red yeah. rhetoric. Isn't not he occasionally been, in the trenches? Picked. Isn't he occasionally? Doesn't he tangle with us down here? I, I don't pay attention to him. I really couldn't tell you, Nathan. I, 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 I couldn't either. That's what I'm asking. I'm trying to make it seem like I must know. I know the answer. To... No, I haven't got a clue what Red Rhetoric does. Uh, and uh, obviously Craig, fight the tight shirt. He's definitely trench level. Yeah, well, he's on his, his own Discord server now, isn't he? Right, so he's in the trenches. Mm-hmm. Well, but nobody's picked him. Is he, is he a good debater? I don't think so. I think he goes for the ad homs too easily. Well, too easily. He that's all he does, he's ad hom. Okay. So just tell us people they don't understand. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, Remember yesterday's ad homs? Scary cat, scary cat, scary cat. Rumpus <laughs> <laughs> hasn't been picked by anybody. Sorry, I missed that. Say that again. Uh, Rumpus has not been picked. And, and the one person who um, mentioned Rumpus said they wouldn't pick him because he ad homes too easily and he contradicts himself. And that so was coming from Rumpus. a bowler. Okay. I really can't remember who else they picked, though. I mean, again, I don't, I don't really know Blue Marble Science. Maybe he's a really cracking debater. Maybe he was fast on his feet. And, you know, it, the videos that he's displayed, you know, demonstrable ignorance in regards to things like containers. Those aside, I'm not even going to laugh about them in this tone because it's just like, well, that doesn't, that's not, that's not the entirety of one man's personality is it that's just one mistake he made online once and still holds true to but you know that's not the point my point is he might be really fast on his feet when he's live you just don't know i don't i certainly don't has anybody encountered him i can't he might have even been here i can't remember has blue marble science been here i, I can't remember not that i recall either way you know if that's their side and they know, I mean, they're going to be watching their own side's videos presumably more than we are. Uh, so they're going to know. Who yeah, that's, right. a, that's a pretty big. Oh my gosh. How do I, I can't, I'm trying to think of a word, but oh, that's you'll come um, to Jim, me. Jim. I don't know what he's like. Oh, and Scott, M. Scott Veach. Science doesn't prove things. That guy. Just on that topic, he loses. Or sequels, Walls of a Container. Say that again? F equals W C. Oh. <laughs> well, when you go around saying science doesn't prove things, and you've got the whole science departments that are charging parents a pretty penny to teach their kids, you're going to have a problem just with people on your own side. I mean, it's over right there. I mean, why even debate a guy like that? He says stupid things like that. And, and as for uh, Blue Science, what's his name? Blue Marble Science. Blue Marble Science. When you show up with a container full of gas and then try to tell us you don't need a container to hold gas, it's over right there. I mean, I, the, the, that, that would be the end of the debate right there. Did anybody pick uh, Zanuck? Uh, he was mentioned, but then dismissed. <laughs> pretty much straight straight away he, he was he was put up as a sacrificial lamb i think and then uh the the, the bowler we were talking to um kind of 
dismissed him as out of hand. <laughs> Again, because he contradicts himself, just like the rumpus. The same reason the rumpus was dismissed. I think Zanuck is a nice debater. The, the, the people who are laying down these standards on the ball side, who are they? Because they don't understand what is required. Because otherwise they'd have picked different people. Um, it, one, one of them was actually Soundly. We, we had Soundly in the server last night and Bev was having a, a chat with Soundly about his uh, his punch train bridge photograph. So um, we asked him who his um, two versus two debating team would be. And another... Who was the other one, Tenth, that was in there? I can't remember. Just a, a was, Discord, Discord debater, isn't he? It, it was a guy who was... I can't remember his name. He was... Wardy. Wardy, isn't it? Okay. So it's I, wasn't not right. a, I wasn't it's, able to see it, but I remember another guy. Yeah. It, it's not a massive It could have been word. Wardy because he came in our server and was asking the same questions. Okay, yeah. We, we kind of put the question to him and then sent him on his merry way to try and try, find out who who would nominate whom, really. As I say, you right. know, I can't speak for Soundly personally, but having sat in this chair for a long time, what is required from the Globe side is double speak and obfuscation. So to say, oh, well, that person contradicts themselves, therefore I wouldn't necessarily give them a great, you know, Sorry, something caught my attention outside. I thought it was something exploding in my kitchen. It's not. It's outside. Yeah, it's. Uh, you need to be able to know how to double speak around a problem, and assert something that's completely contrary to something you've made an assertion about earlier because it falls in line with the criticism. Well, that's a required skill, and there's there's not a great number of them that have that skill. You know, there's a couple of them that are try are trying desperately to acquire that skill, like Kosho. But Rumpus and Zanuck have that skill. Now, I'm calling what is being decried as a, a negative point as a skill because it is, <laughs> if you're on the losing side of an argument and your assertions can be proven incorrect, there is only one defense to that. We well, need to know how to double speak and obfuscate. So, to write those two off because of those things, it's like, oh, no, no, you don't understand the name of the game then. You're on the losing side of this argument, Globeheads. Yeah, it's definitely not a sphere, demonstrably. But if you're on the side that needs to win a few arguments, you need to be able to make sure that those points that are winning points that destroy your side of the argument aren't heard, preferably, because then you don't have to respond to them at all. But if they are heard, you can think on your feet fast enough to double speak around the problem and give a contrary answer that you can justify with a convoluted double speak spew of word salad that somehow seems to make it make sense after you've got around a tricky problem with a bit of double speak. So those are skills that you need if you're on the losing side of an argument. You mean like scaredy cat yesterday? But that's a communication shutdown. So he can't possibly have me point out that an apparent horizon by their current standards is not geometric. And if Al Baruni is measuring to, according to Rumpus, the apparent horizon, he's not measuring the geometric horizon. That's firmly established in their own explanations for why we have the black swan horizon. So it's not geometric. It's apparent. That's their rebuttal. So, OK, when I ask Rumpus if he can see geometric horizons and he says, no, absolutely not. It's not demarcating land and sea. And then we get to Al Baruni, who's measuring that very same geometric horizon he says he can't see. That's a massive problem. So he's got to say, no, he's measuring the apparent horizon. He's got to say he's measuring something. All horizons are apparent, so go with that. That's his skill. Well, when I point out that they're currently telling us that a horizon that's apparent is not geometric, he can't acquire geometry from it then. He's not going to get the R value. Well, that needs to be shut down. Scaredy cat, scaredy cat, scaredy cat is an ad hominem attack against me that he hopes will eventually get bitten on once he's pushed the point far enough away from the concise question being put to him. Again, a skill that's needed... When your point's been demolished, we're all being told currently that the apparent, all horizons are apparent, it's redundant, but the apparent horizon by Globehead standards is something that is not geometric. Now, it might be based, according to their bullshit, on geometry, but it's not geometric. Apparent, geometric, they're different things. 
and according to Rumpus, he even defines it as an arbitrary position in the middle of the ocean that demarcates nothing and only exists in maths. So if that is the case, according to him, how is he going to explain how you've derived geometry by measuring the bloody thing? Because you're acquiring a geometric measurement of an R value from it. Well, you can't. It's the end of his argument. So what's the answer to that little problem? We've got to distract, obfuscate, double speak. <laughs> so you need those skills. Because let's face it, you've got an R value that's been debunked and your, acqu your accu acquisition, acquisition of it, if I can get the word out, the acquisition of that R value is debunked if your horizon's not geometric, as per the definitions of horizons, because all horizons are currently defined under the globe standard, which is to say they're geometric, visible geometric. But as soon as we push it into a mathematical and uh, impossibility, well, suddenly it's got to be described as something other than geometric because the maths doesn't work. But then you end up with two horizons and Al Biruni's measuring the one that you were formerly claiming block boats and buildings. So this hand, this needs obfuscation. It needs shutting down because they've lost. Rumpus knows it. You don't know when you've lost to know when you've got to obfuscate and double speak. All gone very quiet. Oh, I thought you were starting. I saw that. I... <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. I hadn't actually looked at the watch. Let's have a look. Yeah, one minute to go. Welcome to Flat Earth Debate Live. I'm your host, Nathan Oakley, and if you are new to this channel, or you've not done so already, then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you'd like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they are live. There's also a PayPal, Patreon, and crypto link in the info box below the video. Most importantly, if you'd like to join the discussion, simply mute the page you are currently watching, then click the link in the info box below this video to join the panel and express your views on the nature of Earth. If you do join, please don't swear. If you do, you'll be ejected. And if you are, please don't try to rejoin the stream using sock accounts. You'll be warmly welcomed back on the next stream. Please also share the show on social media. Sharing the show obviously increases the live audience, but this in turn increases the chances of a more diverse panel. So please share the show on Facebook and Twitter. And one last time, if you're new to the channel or you've not done so already, then be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification icon to keep up to date with the Flat Earth debate. It's slightly unusual because I'm continually trying to figure out why the lip sync isn't quite perfect on this stream. So I'm going to clap my hands before I introduce the panel members. So that's me done. <laughs> we are joined by, uh, I've forgotten your name already, my friend. I'm really sorry. Let's have a look. It is Scott, Righteous Force, Arwin, Tenth Man, and a whole bunch of people in Discord. So welcome one and all. Hey, hey, hey. Hello. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. That's all I'm getting. Any signs of a physical geometric sphere edge? Morning. <laughs> Morning. <laughs> for, for, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> love, love the Afternoon. conciseness. Uh, any signs of a physical geometric sphere edge horizon, formerly known as Earth Curve? No. That new province called Chaz in Seattle. Chaz is uh, Scott's name for the purposes of the show, is it? No, Chaz is that. Uh, autonomous six block city in seattle 
the, the protesters have. They can't even see a curvature. I don't follow the reference, but if it's a no, then I'll move on. Any signs of axial rotation? Field? <laughs> <None of here. laughs> no motion. Hey, Owen. Hello. So with all the Am wrestling today, loud, lots of wrestling from everybody I see. Am I coming through Neil. loud and clear? Yeah, you are. All but right. Neil's mic is a little hot. He fixed it. Okie dokie. Any scientific evidence of gravity? No scientific evidence of something uh, that's labeled for something else. Yeah. Any... Like scientific evidence of a rainbow. <laughs> uh, you could probably acquire scientific evidence of a rainbow. That's a, a phenomenon. Hmm. Okay, bad example. Moving on. Any single viable hypothesis from any of the fields of astronomy, cosmology, or astrophysics? None whatsoever. They can't get past observation. Hey, Chocolate. Good morning. Can you guys hear me? We hear yeah. you. Good to have you. Cool. Cool. How's everybody? Very well. Wonderful. No complaints. Very good. Oh, wait, Ready? now I got it. Better example for the uh, yeah gravity situation is the ether. That is also an aberration. Uh, so, yeah, aberrations this, uh, are all alike. They're labeling this equilibrium and an object finding rest as gravity. There's proof that with Riley's egg more than what they're saying. Well, they're attributing the force that's exerted through the relative density and the disequilibrium. Indeed, they're misplacing that force and laying it onto another conception for which there is no actual proof. Correct. Any evidence of the distance to the sun? Nope. I can't None. see it. Well, we see it, but we can't get the distance. Any evidence that you can have gas pressure? I see it. Oh, go on. Sorry. I see it. What do you see? Okay, so let's put sticks in the ground. Let's see where that gets us. It gets us sticks on the ground. That's where that gets us. So the shadows don't mean that the, the, the question is, is distance. The, thing? the question oh, right. is distance. Right, yeah, I'm just going to have to presuppose that somehow then. There we go. Any evidence that you can have gas pressure without the necessary antecedent of a container to press upon? According to the ballers, you can go to a propane station with an aquarium and fill it up. <laughs> Well, I, I don't know. I think there's something to be explored in this whole net container zero thing. You've got, Say that again? You've got two containers. Then that's kind of net container zero, isn't it? Oh, I see like. what you're saying. Because the propane guy has a closed container, which he has to give you the gas. Yeah, but then if you put it into an open container, you've got net container zero, I would say. If I was a baller. Or retarded. Net container zero. <laughs> yeah, yeah, two containers. If you're trying to demonstrate gas pressure without a container, you've got a whole net container zero situation if you take gas in a container and put it in a different container. Net container zero. What's your problem? <laughs> yeah, one container minus one container, then you have zero container. There you go. Exactly. The problem is, uh, the problem is I pay the money and I have no gas to show for it. <laughs> You just ended up with net gas zero. That's called entropy. Which, which I guess is not a law anymore, according to some globers. Okay. Depends if it violates your religion. If it violates your religion, you can just disregard it as a natural law, a law of nature, applicable always and inviolable. It, you just ignore it. If you're a fundamentalist religious zealot with a sky that's a vacuum, standing in violation of natural law, well then, shad law shmore, right? <laughs> Lush, 
<laughs> right. Who needs entropy? Entropy, schmentropy, right? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Neil. Give us a New York version of that one. Oh. <laughs> I hear you. Don't worry about it. Catch it on the <laughs> replay of the show. <laughs> you got to tell him, forget about it, Neil. Forget about it, Neil. <laughs> Way to go, John. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Forget about it. Any evidence of an R value, Earth radius? Oh. This is so good. Black Swan. Black Swan. Just the fact that it's a sphere, it's got to have a radius. Who cares how big it is? It's got a radius. You've got a sp- if you've got a sphere, it's got a radius. That's correct. If. What, what sphere? Again? Yeah. And well, if it's a sphere, the it's got a radius. He's that's correct. Sphere. That's right. If it's a sphere... If, if, yeah, of course. So what's the, if, what is what's it, the indication? If, what is a sphere? <laughs> well, I already know where this is going. Who's the guy talking? Tony V. Some Tony V, you there? Tony. Tony V, are you there? I'd like to address your mistake. Sorry, go, go ahead, Tony. No, I just want to, I'm working. Uh, I just want to say hi, and I wanted to say that. But that's it. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, if 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 it's a sphere, and it's got to have a radius, uh, then the radius just at ten miles would make it two hundred sixty-four thousand miles. So everything about their cosmology and everything they've ever done would be wrong. And why did we just find out in 2020 that it's not 3,959 radius, but it's really 264,000 mile radius? Is that something that could go unnoticed all these years? Uh, by some, it would go unnoticed. By others, it shouldn't, though. Flight time B, if it was really 264,000 mile radius versus 3,959, how long would it take to get from L.A. to South Carolina? Uh, an hour and a half. From L.A. Well, to South Carolina? Did you say an hour and a half? <laughs> I thought you said if it was, if it was short and like, like shrunk. I think he's busy. I think he's convoluting uh, east to west flight. For I am, sir. Oh, oh, the oceans must be bigger, right? So then t- Atlantic crossings would take oh, longer. Yeah. Pacific crossings would take longer, right? Yeah. So why did we just find out. out that the Earth was this big if the actual travel time should have told us anyway, right? But the travel time seemed to match with, I guess, what? Does the travel time match with 264,000 mile radius Earth or 3959? Uh, whatever one's the one that works. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I love it. That was good yeah, comedy. Been here Thanks for your you know, I know how to play this input game. there, Tony V. No, I'm just thanking you for the comedy early in the morning. I appreciate it. Uh, well, he's, he, he's not, he's not be... wrong, right? I mean, it's whatever works for them at the time that they needed to work, right? Yeah, that's how this model. goes. <laughs> any so. model. Whatever works, right? It's just a model. Well, that's why it's comedy, because it's not real. It's kind of, If you're going to just say whatever works, then we're not really uh, seriously debating the subject, are we? We're not uh, uh, really I is level. Uh, I, uh, you said that. Your brain the- is- Go on, Tony. Was someone talking? Because I haven't heard anything in the last, like, 15 seconds. 
My yeah, phone's messed up. Man. You you were talking, then you stopped. Oh, oh no! I'm, it's too early for me to like put together sentences that are like three sentences or more right now. So don't expect. Oh, <laughs> don't they expect Look, anything you, you, strong from you this early in the morning? Is what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> it is funny. I like him. Come back tomorrow. I've been here forever. He knows me. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm enjoying this comedy. Back in the day, like, the, like, the good, like the good old days. It was fun back then. <laughs> oh, you mean when the Earth was 39.59? No, back in Diabetes. the days of Oakley's uh, 1 through 11, 1 through 100. <laughs> <laughs> back, back back when the geometric horizon has some type of physicality to block boats and stuff back then way yeah, way were, back those were those the days, were the days. <laughs> my friend <laughs> <laughs> yeah, before we unpicked the curve calculator we used to sit and run things through the curve calculator and argue about how well they matched or didn't match with the curve calculator then over time yeah. exposed how the curve calculator had taken what you see in the image, turned it side view, you put the side of your own head in the shot, removed all aspects of perspective by detailing any target in feet and inches that do not change with distance, unlike angular size. So by the time we'd exposed all that, we ended up detailing what they used to call the curve calculator as the begging the question proof of nothing perspective hijacking curve calculator because it's taken the effects that we see of things getting smaller and smaller into the distance and asserted that that's actually things going over Earth curve. When you point out that you have a diffraction limit, they'll back you, <laughs> like Phil did. So yeah, we've got a diffraction limit. It's like, well, yeah, once we've established that that's the case and it's relevant to optics, that would be things being photographed, you're definitely going to need to stick that in your maths then because you're comparing what your maths does inside view with whole numbers, actual sizes for targets. So what's that? This how how high is this building we're looking at? Oh, it's a hundred feet. It's a hundred feet. But it's one thousand miles away. Yeah, it's still a hundred feet though. Now if I draw that with you on the left hand side of the page and the hundred foot building on the right hand side of the page and I draw a flat line that they're both stood on, because obviously we're presupposing flat earth like you do, you fundy globe head. We're going to assume this flat line is the world we're standing on and we're seeing the side of our own head. And I'm going to draw a line between the side of my own head, which I never see in pictures, and this building that's 100 feet. And you know what? I can draw a line between this building that's 100 feet and me, side of my own head, and write 1,000 miles on it. And according to this diagram, I can see this building. It's amazing. Why can't we see this building on a flat earth? Because according to my diagram, that removes all aspects of perspective and describes how we would see a 100-foot building, even though we see with angular size, apparent size, not actual size, we're always going to have this building described as being 100 feet. It doesn't matter if it's a million miles away, because I can draw the line between the two things and write one million miles on it. We should see it! <laughs> well, why is that? Well, that's because when I draw a globe in and things start to get too small to see... Potentially from the bottom up because of the limitation of the deck you're looking over, the thing that limits the angle of view, causing things to disappear from bottom up. I'm going to assert that that effect is actually caused by a geometric sphere edge horizon that has blocked your view while we completely ignore all aspects of angular resolution and the diffraction limit, otherwise known as perspective. We're going to ignore all of those and assert there's only one reason that things disappear in the distance. That's because they're hidden behind a physical edge called Earth Curve. That's why we use the Earth Curve Calculator to figure out how much stuff's gone in the distance. Because it's Earth Curve causing that. What's that? Perspective? You mean flurf-spective? Ha 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 ha! We're not doing perspective, it's a geometric up. calculation. Right up until the point that we point out that a geometric calculation requires a geometric horizon. And then that's a very real problem and it's basically the end of the maths. We point out how it hijacks perspective. We point out how it uses actual sizes instead of angular sizes, ignoring all aspects of perspective. How it doesn't match the picture you're looking at because you've got the side of your own head. And how you don't have a geometric horizon to base the entire premise of the maths on. 
So you can't come back like you did in the first 100 episodes and just put a calculator under our nose and tell us how it proves Earth's sphere with the presupposition of an R that we've debunked. It can't be like the good old days. Earth's definitely not spherical. And we have exposed every trick in the book that is used to prove to fundies, not really proof, just normally a begging the question fallacy, prove to idiots on the street that they're on a globe. Now, it's not actual proof, it's all logical fallacy, but we've exposed every single trick that is used to assert that we live on this globe. We don't. So, yeah, it can't be like the hundred episodes where we didn't know any of these magic tricks and exposed them. Sorry. No, I wasn't talking like talking shit. I was just reminiscing because that was fun. I had a good time coming on. <laughs> I think yeah, just yeah, because you were winning. Like Ten minutes. Because you were winning. You're That's gonna... why. You were winning. As soon as we opened up the book on the calculator, from the very moment we looked at the calculator and started discussing it, the globe side had won the argument. We were already into begging yeah. the question. So you liked it because you were winning. You liked it because you were winning. Maybe you didn't no. appreciate that. I'm not really winning. No, no. In the first hundred episodes... We, as soon as we use the curve count maths, we're begging the question. We're assuming our outcome. We're assuming Earth's sphere regardless of the outcome of the calculator. Every outcome from the calculator is a sphere win. So the second we start discussing the calculator, like with the Isle of Man, every single discussion and every single show is a win for the globe. Because we're already into begging the question of a globe. You win no matter what the outcome. Now we've exposed that since. So you liked it because you were winning on the globe side. We didn't realise that at the time. We do now and we expose that. Wow. You're good, man. I'm going to tell you what. You have definitely grown as a like a debater in the past, like, thousand shows. I was just, I was just trying to get, like, a compliment. Like, hey, I remember back in the day, but you are damn fucking not going to do that. No, no, I, I'm agreeing with you. But I'm just pointing out the reason you got the endorphin rush that you did is because your side was winning. <laughs> that's all I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah, well, that's when I first started, like, looking into everything you know I, I figured like it was a globe a long time ago but in hawaii is the first time i thought it was globe but that's another oh do i detect a, a subtle change in tone from you oh wait a minute i've been yeah. uh, hawaii seventh oh, hold on hold on tenth man sorry do, 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 do i, I just repeat that into my car I'm sitting here at the best office and some good dude just walked into i'm sat in my car I, I, that was intelligible. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> cool. No, just someone just walked, sat in my car. He's got the same Prius as I do. He came in and thought it was his. And I'm sitting here talking to you, and all of a sudden, some dude's sitting next to me. So he's still on the globe side. <laughs> I, I got, are you still on the globe side, Tony? I was trying to be subtle, but I'll just cut the subtle too. Yes, sir. Uh, why? I am. I'm, oh, because I just, just too much evidence. I just can't. I can't. You know, I mean, you guys really made some pretty good arguments on um, refraction and, you know, the optical side of it. I do have to give you that much, but it doesn't outweigh, like, the two celestial spheres, like, the circle. What celestial side. sphere? Hold oh, on. Can you just let him get into the end of his points? Sorry, Tony. Go ahead. Just like the major ones, the usual ones, the sun not um, changing size. Um, all the other planets are round. But that was kind of a sphere, but that's kind of a crappy one. But what? I don't know. I'm in a crappy mood, so. All right, celestial spheres. Let's start there. What, what, how does that prove you're on a sphere to you? Um, it's just the only way that you can have those patterns in the sky. I mean, there's probably there might be another way. I'll just say that. But the, the one that makes common sense is that we are on a sphere. Oh, that's just, they are all <laughs> sorry, I'll just start again. Have you ever been in a planetarium? You know, that's, uh, sorry. it's very easy to project uh, that. God, this onto is going to be this is going to be much harder than I expected. Obviously, but, sorry, you started yeah. out by begging the question. Let's start slow. Do you know what begging the question is? Of course, I do. <laughs> so I just don't really. That doesn't really matter to me because uh, this isn't a. We're just friends talking. Oh crap! I gotta drive now. Uh, you know what? I'll come on tomorrow or tonight. Okay, fair enough. I can uh, go through it to... with you. We'll 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 <laughs> we'll relinquish you of your globe faith. I assure you. <laughs> I just wanted to ask him, like, if he can't imagine it working any other way than just spheres being spinning around a sphere. Well, has he ever been to a planetarium? 
because they make it look exactly <laughs> like it looks. And they're not spheres. They're actually lights being projected on the inside of a sphere. It looks oh, really inside weird. of a dome. Yeah, I'll dome is... Don't give me an argument. You know I mean? well, yeah. So if you can't imagine it any other way, then realize that it can already be made to look exactly like the real thing. Yeah, they're already doing it. Exactly. If, if you can just do one thing for us, if you can just figure out a way of... Oh, is he gone already? Oh, bummer. So tune in tomorrow for the affirming the consequent formal logically that is the use of the celestial rotation. Uh, how odd is it that some stranger jumps in the passenger seat while he's talking? I think he was being robbed. <laughs> that was funny. Can't, can't lie, but I've heard a story like that before. My friend was waiting for me one time. And <laughs> some time where somebody just got into his car because apparently that person was waiting for somebody with the same car. <laughs> he just got in the car and they just looked at each other like, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, this is not what it was supposed to be. So, goodbye. <laughs> Just for clarity for the audience's sake, so Tony Arwin will remember Tony from way back when, but he was actually one of the more reasonable people on the panel. Now, that's a panel with a very, very, very low standard, I might add. <laughs> but nevertheless, on that very low standard, he was one of the more reasonable people. So, <laughs> he hasn't been around for a while, but I, I sense cyclically that we're going to get some of the older assertions. So I'm going to do a quick shout out to Validation Boy, who was the first to phrase this um, example that I'm going to give in the way that it's being phrased to you now. So every single globe proof ever will start with the assumption that you are standing on a sphere. Now that is the very essence of begging the question. And it was uh, Validation Boy who was the first to point that out or put it onto a video in this arena in the last, I don't know, it was probably four years ago that he did this, but it really resonated with me. It doesn't matter what example they give you. Every example will just force you to assume you're standing on a sphere the moment the premise is being established. So begging the question is the only way they ever get to claim to prove that they're on a sphere. And uh, that was exactly what Tony just did. So... Well, we've got this observation. They normally strap it in with a formal logical fallacy, which is to say they start with a, a premise, Earth is a sphere, and then say something will happen, in this case star rotation. And then they confirm that their globe belief is based on that star rotation that they detailed. So if P, then Q, that would be if Earth sphere, then star rotation, then you have the converse, which is star rotation, therefore Earth is sphere. So it's affirming the consequent formal logical fallacy. If P, then Q, Q, therefore P. And the fallacy is because one doesn't necessarily follow the other. And I'll just example this quickly so that it's clear for the audience. If I eat 10 hamburgers, that would be my if P statement, then I will be very full. That's my Q statement. Now, if I then affirm the consequent, which is to say, if I am very full, I have therefore eaten 10 hamburgers even though I'm actually blind drunk and it's all been beer that I've consumed. So the one doesn't necessarily follow the other. So there we go. That's uh, that's the affirming the consequent formal logical fallacy based on a begging the question fallacy, which is the P statement assumes your outcome if Earth's a sphere. So all examples to demonstrate you're on a sphere will start with the assumption you're on a sphere. Shout out to Validation Boy. How did I not see that, though? I don't understand it. So it's if the outcome is asserted type of setup, basically. You start out asserting the setup. Like, let's start out with it being a sphere. Oh, if it is a sphere, it's like this. Right? It, it, if I give you a different it's premise like that doesn't see, exist, like unicorns. See, if the Earth is a sphere, we'll see star opposite star rotation in the southern hemisphere. So... Uh, it, P, if Q, then P, then we see Southern Star rotation, therefore it's a globe. Right? But yeah. that's not the case exactly, right? <laughs> yeah, so, so. If, if I say, if unicorns are real, then we'll observe grass turning brown in autumn. We do observe grass turning brown in the autumn, therefore unicorns must be real. And I can pepper that with as much qualifying nonsense mm. as I like. 
so long as I affirm the consequent after begging the question. Or to make it a, a more direct begging the question, unicorns are real because the grass turns brown in in the autumn. Well, I would just say, if you're going to pepper anything, go back to the hamburger example. <laughs> Jeez, man, I knew it was coming. That's a, a well-seasoned joke. Oh, very boom, good. boom. <laughs> well, I, I believe that the black swan takes care of that uh, begging question right away because uh, you have to have a physical geometric edge for it to be a sphere. So let's prove it's a sphere first. I did. I did like that. What Tony said, though, he he gave us, I guess, props. You want to say for the the our re, the refraction and the optical side of it. He said, and I I had a little uh, like I smirked a little bit when he said that because I was like, I wonder if he's understanding that his side has kind of jumped on the optical side of the argument and given up the physical side of it, and now they're telling that us that we're seeing horizons because they're apparent. And you make we're a, being you told make a that we're, we're forgetting about optics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there used to be excuses, right, for why we're seeing what we're seeing, but now those are their excuses for why we're seeing a horizon where it's not supposed to be. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, it's about no, I said you make a very good point. They have to, uh, just like Coriolis, they have to prove it's not happening. Sometimes I wonder if we're here as a, a test bed so that the fundy double speakers can come and formulate their double speak in a coherent manner and see it play out against opponents. How well does this double speak go over? So, I mean, it, that's, it could be easily spun into conspiratorial speak, but I'm sure people know what I'm talking about when I say it seems like the rhetoric will change. So before the show in the yeah. pre-show, we had an example of a Wikipedia entry changing. Because of current rhetoric that's being discussed, Jaronism has gone through multiple examples where the rhetoric has changed before his very eyes. We've seen it during the first 100 shows when we were discussing things seen from Google Earth. So these examples make you feel like, well, are we here so that the uh, they can tighten up their double speak, so to speak? Well, if we're going to be here and we're not going to go away, they might just as well use us as uh, yeah, practicing ground against us. No. Well, they probably shouldn't have come in with uh, the geometric horizon exists in math only, <laughs> and then proceed to tell us how that math gets refracted into an apparent horizon. Yes, uh, refracted math, man. <laughs> refracted math. Yep. It makes me, <laughs> yeah. it makes Thanks, me think of like the, the the virtual reality vision of the nineties or something. You know, that's well, they don't want to refract. They don't want to admit. They're, they're unwilling to admit it's a thought experiment, that it's not physical, it's not real. Uh, it's never existed, of course, but, but they have to go to math to make it exist. But I thought they, they're telling us we have to embrace the fiction in our science, man. Well, that's what he's doing, isn't he? He's embracing it with math. But that's not science. <laughs> that's math. <laughs> Hey, they'll take a they'll take anything right now, even the bone on the ground they'll take. Gotcha. The common <laughs> vernacular is rife with convolution of maths and science. I see it all day. It doesn't matter what subject I look into, that if they've done a bit of maths and done some careful calculations, they'll say, Look man, this is just science. <laughs> You're like, What? I see it. I saw it in acoustics today. So a guy I like, one of the acousticians I've been following, was talking in an interview with another acoustician I like, and they're having a little conversation, and he's detailing how room modes work and how the sound bounces back and forth between the room, uh, between the walls, and is self-cancelling if it's the same wavelength, and you get a half-inverse wave. I'm like, yeah, this all makes perfect sense. So it bounces off the wall, flips, so it's the opposite phase, and then interacts with the original wave cancelling itself. I understand that's perfectly sensible. And then he said, this is just science. <laughs> I could have slapped him <laughs> through the screen. <laughs> it's not science, that's maths! <laughs> uh, he probably still thinks that math is just a part of science. You know? Most people, that's my point. That's my point. Most people day. do. I, I'm sorry. That's all right. I was just going to say, most people do. It doesn't matter what I see. Tire of you. 
I've taken these Michelin tyres, these Bridgestones and these Pirellis and I've put them on the same car under the same exact test conditions. It's all controlled. And the Pirellis were more grippy. Scientifically validated, Pirellis are better. Yep. <laughs> I read I a quote nonsense. the other day, I, I believe it was by Nikola Tesla, and it goes, uh, today's scientists have sub substituted mathematics for experiments, and they wander off through equation after equation and eventually build a structure which has no relation to reality. End quote. Roll out the pseudo-Ramonian force space from Einstein, its length, breadth, depth, and conceptual time model with geodesics running through space-time! Yeah, th that's exactly that, precisely. He's detailing Einsteinian pseudo ramonian force space, a conceptual medium we do not live in, that affects nothing, that has no forces. <laughs> you know, that's what that's exactly what that is. Right, a few shout-outs. So shout-out to Cleary, who says, there are two gears in the night sky. That's a nice way of phrasing it, Cleary. I like that. Thank you very much indeed for the super chat. Emma UK also, shout-out to Emma UK. You got quite a fairly lengthy discussion about you and your show in the pre-show, Emma. But a uh, big shout-out to you. Thank you for the super chat. You have a feisty chat today with plenty of socks. Excellent stuff. That's what I like to see. It's the pits, my chat. And I'm very proud to say that it's the pits. It is. <laughs> anyway, thank you for the super chat, Emma UK. Really appreciate it. Subscribe today to Emma UK. Al Junkie also, thank you very much indeed for the super chat. If beggars... If a beggar's rich... Should we question the begging? Uh, I hope that's not a reference to me because, number one, I'm definitely not rich. So hopefully that's not a reference to me. But thank you very much indeed for, to the to Al Junkie for the super chat. I got a, I got a, a story for that begging <laughs> from Al Junkie. We were going to uh, L.A., which we seldom do, but it was uh, for, uh, I think... Uh, it was a wedding. Yes, it was a wedding we we're going to. So uh, we pull up off the freeway and we're about to make a right turn. And right in the center island, there's this guy in the wheelchair uh, and he's got a sign up asking for money. So as we're about to make the right turn, it was his lunch break, I guess, because he just got up and started walking away to go get lunch. And we were dying laughing. And so uh, we were just watching where they take turns sitting in the wheelchair begging for food. So, Yeah, that's bad. I mean, I, I make a, a joke about it occasionally in the chat. I'll be like, smash the super chat. And then if somebody even hints that I'm rich, I'll say, look, the Lamborghini's not going to pay for itself. And then if that gets a laugh, I'll go, no, 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 you don't understand. It's a lease. It's a lease. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Yeah, just I don't have a Lamborghini. Not that anybody in the chat was under the delusion that I did. The ballers might uh, take you on to task with that one. That said, so yeah, I'm, I'm sure somebody what? can Photoshop your face over somebody with what? a Lamborghini. I have a question. Why is there somebody in the G Plus panel named Scott? Oh, he's oh, who's that? <laughs> he's all good. He's he's part of G, he's part of Master B. Oh, okay, I was just wondering who that is. I'm like, hey, who's this uh, person? Hey, well, I may as well do this on the live show now. So, um, basically, one of the things that Bev Try Thinking's been using as a citation is a Wikipedia definition of water level, and I've just got it on screen for the audience now. Um, but the definition has changed, so we've had it highlighted to us. This was done in the pre-show in terms of the definition surface of liquid water level to establish horizontal plane of reference has now been changed to establish a local horizontal plane of reference so just a subtle change that actually assists Bev in his argument and that was the conclusion that was drawn in the pre-show check it out Nathan Oakley channel goes out 9pm UK time Oh, bit of da there. Let's shout out Unitox Femu. Thank you very much indeed for the super chat. Unitox Femu, who calculated radius of Jupiter, Saturn? Uh, that's use of Kepler's third law of interplanetary motion and an assumption that Venus, for the scalar, is the same size as Earth. So the assumption that if anybody's ever wondered, why is it the sister planet 
Why are we twinned with Venus? Well, that's because it's been assumed to have the same radius value as Earth, so they can apply Kepler's third law of interplanetary motion and get the distances and scales and sizes of everything. Assume that it has the same radius as Earth, which based on the assumption that it's a ball in the first place. Yeah, that's assume, just... step one, assume Earth is a sphere. Step two, assume the radius. Step three, assume Venus is also a sphere. Step four, assume it has the same radius as Earth. Now, that's only a few assumptions. That's okay, right? And from here, we can do all the maths. It's all good. <laughs> it's all good. So, Don't worry about the, four, the first four or five assumptions. So, again, this is... I don't have a full understanding of what Kepler's third law is, but from what you just said there, if if the Earth's radius is different, as uh, Mr. Sensible said, what was his famous saying there? At best, you would have debunked Earth radius. Right. I love it. All right, so now it's 264,000 just at 10 miles. Then what happens to Kepler's third law in interplanetary motion? I'm sure you, if you applied it, you could just push the distances and sizes out. So, you know, you, you just need a, a scalar, I think is the word that Anthony Riley uses when he describes it. Sleeping Warrior, to those of you subscribed on YouTube or subscribed today to Sleeping Warrior. But yeah, you can you can scale this any way you like. And the scale has changed. So, um, I can't, I don't know which Geronism video to recommend in this regard. It's probably four years old now. But Geron just went through it. You can change the numbers any way you like. Push the distances out. Oh, I can never remember the damn guy that was the guy that put the objection forward in the first instance. But a, a very well known guy whose name I can never bloody remember. But basically went, hang on a second. <laughs> that would make these stars absolutely enormous. And then that got reverse engineered into the maths and we end up with Beetlejuice and things being absolutely massive. So, you know, if there's a little problem, well, that would make it enormous. Well, then you make it enormous. It's just a bloody light in the sky. Who's to say that Beetlejuice isn't a twinkly little tiny light that's, a, you know, a, a pin prick in a, in a sheet over the top of a dome or an absolutely enormous star? <laughs> well, you just change the maths whatever you like. You can do whatever you like in the maths. It's just a model. But we have one big glaring problem with that. Uh, I'll explain the 99 that we don't have a problem with. We're not on Betelgeuse. We're not on Venus. We're not on any of these other supposed planets. But we are on this one, the Earth, which they assume has a radius of 3959. All of a sudden, now we have the black swan, and the radius at 10 miles, and it's much further than that, uh, is 264,000 miles. So we can test this one, and that's why the black swan knocked them out. Yeah, the radius about has been fixed. Planet. Why no does response? The... No hold on, response. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Go ahead, Paul. Why does the word planet have the have a like a most of it would mean plane? Dun dun dun. Don't point that out, Paul. Okay, I'm going to do a couple of quick shout-outs. Good point, Paul. Unitox Femi says, Common sense. Ha, 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 Thank you very much for the super chat, Unitox Femi. Bleeding Warrior. Shout-out to Lying Warrior. <laughs> Thank you very much for the super chat, Bleeding Warrior. Also, I think there was another one. Yes, there was. Cleary. Oh, hang on. There's another one as well. Cleary's just slipped off the page because someone else has super chatted. Cleary, thank you very much indeed for the super chat. Oh, I always enjoy the chocolate sayings. Very good. Boom, boom. Thank you very much for the super chat, Cleary. Really appreciate your support. Also, Unitox Fremu again. Nathan and QE deceiving. Is that deceiving? World, not NASA, is obvious. Okay. Thank you very much indeed for the super chat. Unitox Fremu. Shout out back to you, Cleary. Chocolate say that, that was sweet. Excellent. Some chocolate, bro. <laughs> Why do you think I said it? <laughs> I know. <laughs> so yeah, Paul. Plan, net, plane, airplane, plane. Flat, flat lands. Uh, flat. You have <laughs> for a plane. Flat, flat toes. Salt flats. 
and what was it? Uh, the 10th man likes this quote from NASA that you have to assume the earth is flat and non-rotating. And I think it's interesting, speaking of non-rotating, even in Einstein's equations, for them to function properly, of course, Jesse wants to get her two cents in, uh, as I say this. <laughs> um, she, uh, everything has to be moving. What if the earth is stationary? What does it do with Einstein's equations if the earth is stationary and it's not moving? Oh, no, no. Must be very afraid of that. Like your, uh, Edwin Hubble. Remember he said he can't, can't have a can't have the earth in a, a special location where everything moving away and around around it right matter of fact let me go get that quote because that was a pretty good quote by it. What, wasn't there a movie the, the day the earth stood still no i think this is in, <laughs> this is in reference to the cmb right the cosmic microwave background radiation stuff that's that's a reaction to that because i, I well maybe, maybe i'm vague on this chocolate will tell us in a moment but that that essentially puts us at a central location. I got the quote. So it's Edwin Hubble out of the observ observational approach to cosmology. Quote, the assumption of uniformity has much to be said in its uh, heliocentrism, heliocentrism vast universe theory favor. But we would not expect to find the distribution in which the density increases with distance symmetrically in all directions. Such a condition would imply that we occupy a unique position in the universe, analogous, in a sense, to the ancient conception of a central Earth. The hypothesis cannot be disproved, but it is unwelcome and would be accepted only as a last resort in order to save the phenomena. Therefore, we disregard this possibility and consider the alternative, namely a distribution with thin, which thins out with distance. The unwelcome supposition of a favored location must be avoided at all costs. End quote. So Hubble was the biggest double speaker there is. He's convoluting every single aspect of the scientific method in that statement. So he's describing how a hypothesis will save a phenomenon. Um, no, the supposition that he details at the end would be part of the hypothesis yet to be validated, and the phenomena would be something that you're studying at step one. But he's detailing how he's going to save a phenomena that's detailing a, con a concept. But yeah, he's called it a phenomena. It's an outrage. Well, it sounds like he's defending a worldview and a philosophy, not science. That's what he's defending. That's so precisely that, what he's doing. Sense. That's precisely just what he's doing. posted it in Ballbusters if you want to put it up, Nathan. Mm -hmm. I should have given it to you before. That's yeah, okay. Can you, can you put it in Master B, too? <laughs> yeah, I got you. Give me a second. Yeah, I'll stick it up on the screen, but yeah. When we talk about people being pseudoscientists, this is like poster child statement for that. Because every word is being used from his standpoint of science to the local yokels. And that standpoint of science is being used with scientific vernacular in a colloquial sense. It's just wrong. I mean, it's, n it's nothing short of anything else that people in cosmology do. They that's what they do. They are, by definition, pseudoscientists. They have nothing beyond observation of phenomenon. But in this instance, he's even he's even convoluted that into something that's conceptual and describing how his hypothesis is gonna save it. What save your concept? Because it's completely untenable. Oh right. And what does your concept have? Well it has nihilism at its heart, doesn't it? And we can't have that. We can't have we can't have anybody being in any way unique. No, 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 no. We're not unique as a position. No, that's just untenable. We can't have that. And given that we've got control of this conceptualization, we can do whatever we bloody like. But let's make it sound like science, so anybody reading this horse shit will think that they're actually being told about something scientific, which they're absolutely not. I, I love that he says it must be avoided at all costs. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> uh, well, well, therein that... lies, therein lies okay. their unwillingness the to consider fish. the creator. Because if they, that's why it has to be avoided. 
Exactly. That's what I read when I hear that shit. I'm like, ooh, you guys. It makes you guys a little nervous to think, to even think, to, to even try to postulate that we might be the center of the universe. That we might not be what you think it is. And then you're going to ignore the observations and then just go the other route and say, that must be avoided at all costs in order to save our hypothesis, <laughs> which should be based on our phenomena, which we see, which we must avoid. <laughs> it's insanity, man. Absolute insanity. Just quick, another quick shout out to Unitox Femi, who says, this is not proven fact, but is fact. Nice double tweet there, <laughs> Unitox Femi. Thanks for the super chat. Here, I'll use this analogy uh, that I use all the time. If I'm, a, if I'm a detective and I walk into a room and there's a dead body on the floor, if all I have is natural causes, am I a good detective? What do you mean? After you've investigated the crime? Hold on just one second. Well, Rest, yeah, I mean, my, my presupposition, there's no intelligent Hold agency on. in this murder whatsoever. Only thing I have is natural causes. So would, would I be a good detective? No. Well, not if you Why? walk in it with, with a freaking knife sticking out of his chest. <laughs> and you say, well, somehow naturally that happened. <laughs> yeah, I'd say, yeah, maybe you should be fired from the force. <laughs> But gravity chocolate, gravity, it fell off a shelf by gravity. It sh somehow an earthquake occurred, fell off a shelf, and it plunged into his back because of gravity. Natural causes. Oh, so final destination, is it? Okay. Gra gravity's <laughs> the backstabber. <laughs> it's been stabbing him in the back for 105 years. <laughs> Old and busted. <laughs> Let's see that the argument from the from the atheist side is that's God of gaps. So if I invoke any kind of natural or any kind of intelligent agency whatsoever, that's God of the gaps. But that's that'd be the same thing of me saying, well, because I say, well, there's the guy was murdered because there's a knife that's sticking out of his back. You know, that's that's intelligent agency. But you know, I mean, just the logic of that is saying just arbitrary saying that's that's God of the gaps is not valid. Well, what it proves, Paul, is that you as a detective in that scenario, you already have a presupposition no matter what. It can never be another person, another intelligent being. It always has to be something else. So you would not make a good detective because your bias is ruling out another potential for the reason. Either, either that or he works for Hillary Clinton and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, people can nice stab themselves in the middle of their back by themselves, you know. Nice one. <laughs> gotcha. I think that was one of your best ones, man. <laughs> Good morning. What, does, does it everybody just uh, shoot themselves in the back of their head twice, three times? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right. And, and that doesn't take the wallet? <laughs> Good. One sec. Good morning, I'm gonna give, I'm, I'm gonna help the ballers out a little bit, but even if a if a person kills them, it can be still explained naturally because isn't a human natural? So even if there's a knife sticking out of his back, it's natural causes. Right, I'm gonna, steal, I'm gonna steal a line from QE just to end this. Right, what's the difference between natural and synthetic? Man made. A man making it. Paul, Paul was just trying to throw throw the fishing line out there. I think <laughs> stony silence is because this is a QE rebuttal. So when people try and juxtapose supernatural with man-made or natural, you have to ask them and get them to define the difference between synthetic which is very specific and rigorously defined, and natural. Because when you're trying to establish cause, that's what the scientific method does, the reason it's defined here very specifically and accurately as dealing with natural phenomena, it's because if you have something that is synthetic, you know what caused it. A man made it. So that is already established as the cause of whatever it is that you're trying to figure out the cause of 
Now, not limited to, but including things like gyroscope deviation or pendulums deviating. What caused this phenomena? What phenomena? How many pendulums do you come across in nature deviating? You don't. It's man-made. Oh, so there goes the shoe. Well, they only give you two choices. They only give you physical and natural and supernatural, right? But that's a false dichotomy. There's actually three categories. Supernatural, information, time, thoughts, those types of things. Physical and natural, sulfur, frogs, water, trees, and then man-made barbecue grills, indie cars, shoes. See the three? There's not two. Numpties. Also, um, I got a uh, shameless plug. Q sure. Live today on Quantum Eraser Channel. The Retard Manifesto. You can't miss this, folks. 1 p.m. U.S. Central, 7 p.m. U.K. Be there. Be severe. Thank you. I'll, I'll sell you a, a gram of memories. Hmm. That's doable, right? Physical That's what? thing, isn't it? Memories, information. That's physical, right? Okay. Okay. Can I pay with that with, with a bag of fives? <laughs> bag of fives, yes, please. <laughs> then we have a deal. Can I push down the synthetic just a little bit more? Um, I'll push it down, like make it go deeper with it. Um, usually, synthetic things means there's specified complexity to them. Which means I can put all the materials for an airplane in a in a hangar, ah! and time will not cause that thing to come in. All the materials, the raw materials that come ah! in, that thing, it takes the ability to specify complexity or make these things more specific and do certain things for it to become an airplane. Specify complexity. You're speaking my love language. Uh, I was weird. Hey, go ahead. Go a little bit deeper. <laughs> you can go further, Huey. No, I don't just need in the background here. You're, that's a whole presentation well at least a little bit of one i just woke up and the power's been out for about two hours so well i can summarize it based on it's what not it's really it's not really a detail i mean think about it it's the difference between a sand castle and a sand dune right? yeah damn you chocolate i was literally about to say exactly those words and before the show really? before you got here they were saying who, who would you pick as like a top level debater and i said you and the reason I gave was because often chocolate will be there when I don't necessarily have the right argument to hand and you'll be there like Johnny on the spot with it. And in this instance, I was like edging my way in to say, if you've got a sand castle, <laughs> right there, you can you, the exact same example. It's a QE example, by the way. That's a best. That's a really good example because everyone can visualize it. Can you repeat it? QE, Except. As it's yours. Yeah, it's the difference between a sand dune and a sand castle. I mean, you could be walking on the beach. Just picture yourself, you and your friends, walking on the beach. There's no one on the beach, and you come by this elaborate sand castle. We've all seen them, right? Some more elaborate than others. Anyway, you're walking on the beach because there's only two choices, right? Either intelligent agency. This is onto, this is a proxy on the ontological primitives. Intelligent agency or nature. So you're walking on the beach with your friends. You come by this elaborate sandcastle and you say, stop everyone. You say, wow, isn't that amazing? I can't wait to come back tomorrow and see what the wind and waves will make. You see, no one's going to say that because your buddies are going to call a mental health institution on your dumb ass. Follow Good, good example indeed it is a great um analogy to the ontological primitives because yep. as you rightly point out you can either have one of two choices either this sand castle blew into existence by pure chance because there was enough time elapsed for that construction to create itself yeah that ain't gonna happen or <laughs> somebody put it together that would be intelligent design Exactly. That's this, simple. Uh, uh, well, we've got to extrapolate that out just before the show ends live. So stay tuned if you're watching on the premium stream. But to, to elaborate out on that, that applies to our entire existence in case anybody missed that subtlety. So there's either one of two choices. One, nature 
created itself out of nothingness in the similar vein that the sandcastle blew into existence merely because enough time elapsed. So nature created itself or intelligent design created what we have before us. Those are your only two choices. They are called the ontological primitives, nature or intelligent design. Now, if you work with the, the, the latter, the intelligent design, well, then the parameters are wide open to be basically anything because its operation is outside of our parameters because that is akin to a programmer making a game. The programmer isn't subject to the rules that he's going to impose on the game if he's creating it. Now, unlike that scenario, if you have the converse or the other ontological primitive, which is nature created itself, then you're under the parameters of nature when you describe that. Well, nature has got certain parameters which we understand implicitly. They're called laws, the laws of nature, one of them being the first law of thermodynamics. The energy can't create itself. So because of the limitations of nature, it immediately rules out any possibility that nature can poof itself into existence, like the sandcastle. Therefore, we must have intelligent design. It is without question. Another direct, I forgot to finish it up. I forgot to finish it up. Um, the, the functional sequence specified complexity of just a simple, the most primitive cell dwarfs by exponential magnitudes the functional sequence specified complexity of that sandcastle. That's very important. I left that out. Thanks. Something organic in terms of its actual complexity is orders of magnitude more complex than something that somebody's put several hours into making with sand. That's what you're saying. Yeah, it's it, yes, it's still the sandcastle still specify complexity. However, it 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 wilts in comparison to just the simplest cell that you can think of. Fair enough. With that, I'm going to say, if you are watching this on the Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley primary streams, then stay tuned as there will be an after show to follow. Unfortunately, if you're watching this live, this is where we bid you farewell. There was actually one last super chat, I think, from Al Junkie. So Chuck Norris ate R for breakfast this morning, he says. So thank you very much indeed for the super chat. Uh, as I say, stay tuned if you're watching on one of the premiering streams. Massive thank you to today's Discord and G Plus panels for making today's live show possible. I've been Nathan Oakley, and I'll see you all in the next video. information uh battling just the information because quantum most don't know quantum mechanics they'll they'll bumble fumble and stumble through that so i often don't bring that up only as a capper i'll just cap everything with it with attitude <laughs> say, say it with your chest <laughs> What's the conservation of momentum? Oh, well, they destroyed her. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, that's the funniest part. You even say what will be destroyed. It, it won't be destroyed. <laughs> what, will, what, will, what will be destroyed, bro? What are you talking about? <laughs> what, one of my favorites oh is my Coriolis effect. The collisions of hurricanes? But what, what, where's the hurricanes fit in this little frigging tail you got going on? One of my favourites is Coriolis effect is the conservation of angular momentum. Yeah, like, that Zanuck last night in the arena, he, he's such a doofus. I, I shouldn't even talk to him anymore. I don't even know why I do it. Like stars in your eyes. And tonight, Coriolis effect <laughs> is the conservation of angular momentum. Dun, 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 smoke. No, stars, he says lights. conservation of momentum. If he says, if they say conservation of angular momentum, that's even stupider. A yeah, linear is what he, they need. He did say that on 24-7 yesterday.
You know, con conservation, of, conservation of linear momentum, that's what they're saying when they're saying conservation of momentum. But that, that doesn't have anything to do with hurricanes. Or Coriolis. <laughs> or Coriolis. Right? Uh, let's put the caveat in. You could have an example that included uh, Coriolis with hurricane. If you personally got picked oh, up God. by the hurricane and were whipping around at a great rate of speed... And you look down at a car on the road that hadn't been picked up and went, you know what? That car looks like it's deviating. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even joking. That is an actual Coriolis effect example. So if you look down from a spinning reference frame of a hurricane, see something that, you know, happens to be concreted into the ground, looking like it's moving, deviating from straight, even though it's not moving at all. Well, that apparent deflection of that item because you're spinning in a hurricane is Coriolis effect. But other than that, same goes for water going down the drain. If you're in a massive lake or, yeah, a massive, like one of those lakes they use to feed all the people the water and it's got one of those man-made drains right in the middle, right? But it's had a load of water come in and there's a massive whirlpool going down this drain and you swim out to it and start going down the drain. In other words, you are now part of a non-inertial spinning reference frame. You and the spinning are as one. But as you look up out of the drain... And you look up and you go, wow, that plane in the sky looks like it's moving to the right because <laughs> I'm spinning <laughs> as I go down this drain in the water. Well, that would actually be an example of Coriolis effect a not actual deflection of an aeroplane that's not in your spinning reference frame. That's actually Coriolis. All examples of you looking at hurricanes aren't you observing from a non-inertial spinning reference frame unless you're in it actually spinning around same goes for water yeah. unless you're in the water spinning down the drain observing something seem to curve when it's not really curving then you're not describing yeah. coriolis effect so hurricanes go on sorry you're having entirely too much fun with this well this is kind of like when xanik used to put like uh hot spinning hot tubs with torpedoes being fired from one side. Yeah, to another. torpedo. Yeah, right. I got one for you. Hold on. I got one for you. So you're in a tornado and you're spinning around, but and you're looking down on a uh, spinning merry-go-round merry with a chair on it. What's that? What, what happens then? Well, the whole thing, the whole uh, roundabout that's spinning, as you observe the entire structure, as you whip around in the hurricane, you could see the entire structure seeming to deviate from its actually concreted into the ground position. But as for its rotation, that's kind of irrelevant in terms of your moving in the hurricane. So as you rotate in the hurricane, what other things do in the inertial reference frame is entirely irrelevant. It doesn't matter if the thing you're looking at is concreted into the ground or flying in a different reference frame completely, like an aeroplane moving above you in the hurricane. Well, ultimately speaking, that motion of the inertial reference frame doesn't depict what you observe, which is not actual deflection of that item. So it's got sod all to do with it, to answer your question. Yeah, but the other the other guy, the, the spinning merry-go-round, that's not in the inertial reference frame. Yeah, it is. From your vantage no, point. It, it's from, rotating. In, uh, uh, how dare you? No. <laughs> no. How dare you? <laughs> Regardless of the fact that it is rotating that would be the roundabout as far as the observation that is going to depict coriolis is concerned it's only ever referenced from your vantage point spinning around in the hurricane so i'm flying around in the hurricane looking at anything else that's not in my reference frame that's spinning anything that's not in my reference frame that spins will appear to deviate because i'm spinning well it doesn't matter that something else is also spinning in the inertial reference frame it's got nothing to do with my observation of it like a bullet doesn't matter that the bullet might be rifled and spinning in that axis. Does it make any difference to the fact that as I observe it from the hurricane, spinning around in the hurricane, I look at the bullet and go, look at that bullet. It looks like it's curving. But it's also spinning in a, a rifled action, a rifled motion. Well, so what? It doesn't make any difference to my observation from the non-inertial spinning reference frame of a hurricane that I'm in. <laughs> well, you said he was that also talking time. about it's uh, almost convincing. What do you call it? The earth spin catching up to the speed of the I, earth. I, I, plane. I, I, I don't know. QE's deliberately trying to get my goat or what? Well, almost <laughs> convincing. 
<laughs> almost are you playing a baller or what almost convincing but nothing i said was inaccurate no just messing with you man i can't uh, you you could be i didn't i don't have the right answer i just put the scenario out for you fair enough the, the roundabout in the inertial reference frame even though it may be potential it may have the potential for someone else to observe coriolis from that particular spinning thing doesn't make any difference to what the observation uh, what will be observed by someone who is actually on a non-inertial spinning reference frame because you can only have hmm. one person making the observation so it doesn't matter that you might have a second person you'll have to make a second coriolis example if you're going to detail that roundabout as a non-inertial spinning reference frame because as far hmm. as you are concerned in your spinning reference frame that's just something else in the non in in the inertial reference frame god damn it i nearly got there without one single mistake <laughs> Yeah, I think we could put that one to bed. That's nonsensical, anyway. No, it wasn't. I even, I even unpicked what you said and gave it clarity. You, you are, you're tr deliberately trying to wind me up now. I'm going to start. Calming nah, down it's uh, it's just early in the morning, man. I'm not ready. Fair enough. Well, that's even worse. You're groggy and you wound them up. <laughs> Where'd you get what that picture at? What does momentum mean? Where'd you get that picture at? This one. Just Google. Yeah. Google. Love Can't it. Remember. Yeah. It's really good. Nice, isn't it? I just wanted a picture of a horizon. I'm pretty sure I found it with a Google search for horizon. It's a beautiful picture, man. Where is that from? Is that like Iceland or something? From Google. No, I know you, where you got it from. <laughs> I don't I mean, know. I've no is... idea. Literally, I have no idea of the provenance of this picture whatsoever. Uh, it's, is my it's mic really... not working? Yes, we hear you. <laughs> I'm asking what does conservation of momentum mean? I'll break it down. What, what, what does conserve mean? Because that was what Zanuck was saying yesterday on 24-7, that you have to allow for the plane to catch up to the Earth's speed. No. Oh, that's... goodness. <laughs> uh, sorry, I can just, just let's dice out that quickly. So, no. Nothing that takes place in the inertial reference frame in this example, what a plane's doing in terms of it speeding up or speed or slowing down, is relevant to an observation of Coriolis, which will only ever take place from a spinning reference frame. So to de to de to be a capable of detailing a Coriolis effect, you must start by observing something whilst spinning. So it's going to be a a, a description of an observation while you are spinning. That's all you're ever going to have as a description of Coriolis. So if I now just start describing what a bullet does through the air, well, that's not me observing something while spinning, is it? So just keep in the back of your mind, is this an observation whilst spinning? If it's not, I, well, the plane's going to have engines, so therefore no Coriolis. No, no. Is a plane having engines observing something while spinning? Yes or no? Anybody? Nope. No. So, therefore, it's not going to be an example of Coriolis effect. That brings up yeah, a question. Yeah, but he was asking, hold on a second. He was asking specifically about conservation of momentum. Was that Neil? Yeah, it was. Hey, Neil, yeah, I'll put, it in, I'll put the definition of Master B citation for you. Yeah, and then you tell us whether this had anything to do with conservation or Coriolis effect. Go ahead, Neil. What was that? We just want to know what the example was in more detail, because I've pounced on it and said it's not Coriolis, but then QE's qualified it by saying, well, Neil's not asking about Coriolis. He's specifically asking about conservation of momentum. Yeah, well, he was saying that when the plane takes off, you have to allow it, you know, it's already moving in the Earth's speed. Yeah, that's but that's I, preposterous. That's You're going to know right away, right? If a, if you got the Earth spinning from west to east, you have a uh, runway facing west. Let's say, let's keep all the numbers even. Let's say it's spinning at 1,000 miles an hour, right? And the plane takes off at 200 miles an hour west. What these idiots are saying is that the plane, when it takes off, it's got all the momentum going east, so it's only got 200 going west. So it's going to fly, essentially, it's going to fly backwards for, for some time until it gets enough 
chutzpah to overcome that momentum it had going east, right? So it's going to it's gonna slowly, then it's going to slowly stop. It's going to hover there in like suspended animation and then slowly overcome that momentum and fly west. It's abject, ludicrous absurdity. How about that? Especially when you put it like that. Shout uh, out to Danny P. Two things. Uh, why do aircraft carriers um, go as fast as they can in one direction and when the plane is trying to take off and going as fast as they can in the opposite area so the plane can land? Why is that? But if the plane was trying to land on an airplane, he maintained his conservation of minutes. As he turned to try to land, and if it was all still moving, it would be all kinds of craziness trying to, to land on an aircraft carrier, it would think to me. But right. I don't know. Maybe, okay, maybe so I don't understand uh, fully. Good question. Good point. And Quantum Eraser's description is also right. He's, he's just detailed the abject ludicrous nature of this. But back to the live show when I said, well, no, every single example that is claimed to prove a globe will start with the assumption that you're on a globe. Well, this example, it's Earth turn. So the assumption starts with Earth is turning. That's the first premise that we have to accept to then unpack what a plane does under the assumption that it's going to retain the velocity of the Earth that's spinning that you've just assumed in your first premise. It's a begging the question fallacy that is unnecessary. Because what is the claim that we have that is asserted to prove Earth spinning? Well, Coriolis deviation is angular the retention of angular velocity. Coriolis effect? No. So why are we arguing about it? Well, because it gets them on this track where they've already begged the question that Earth's spinning, and we're going to argue back and forth about whether or not the plane is retaining the velocity of the Earth that's spinning that we're assuming, or not retaining the velocity of the Earth that we're assuming to spin. So it's a win-win right. then for them, once once we're all on this same track of begging the question and arguing about what's going to happen when we all assume Earth's spinning. Right. Now, let that's me define this constellation. Hold on a second. Up. I'm going to define it for you, Neil. You tell me, every member of the audience, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you tell me if the conservation of momentum, after I read the definition out, it has anything to do whatsoever with hurricanes. From the Khan Academy, there are many conserved quantities in physics. They are often remarkably useful for making predictions in what would otherwise be very complicated situations. In mechanics, there are three fundamental quantities which are conserved. These are momentum, energy, and angular momentum. Conservation of momentum is mostly used for describing collisions between objects. Just as with other conservation principles, there's a catch. Conservation of momentum applies only to an isolated system of objects. In this case, an isolated system is one that is not acted on by force external to the system, i.e. there is no external impulse. What this means in the practical example of a collision between two objects is that we need to include both objects and anything else that applies a force to any of the objects for any length of time in the system. End of citation. Let me ask you a question. What in the world does that have to do with a hurricane? Absolutely nothing. Nothing exactly. whatsoever. What does that have to do with the Coriolis effect? Zero. <laughs> nothing. Exactly. Boneheads. What they got is a 1956 physics glossary, and all they do is, like, pin the tail on a donkey, pick out terms they have no clue what they mean, put them together, because Joe Coffey and Betty Breadmaker doesn't have a science acumen. These idiots know it. They don't have one, but they make one up. They just string a long sentences of friggin' words together that make absolutely no sense. But Joe Coffey and Betty Breadmaker is like, oh, my God, that sounds sciency. He must be a scientist. Clowns! Both parties. And that's what happened. That's exactly what happened on 24-7 with Zanuck yesterday. He had them all confused. No, he did it. <laughs> he called them out on that immediately. <laughs> oh, you missed it too. You might have came in after chocolate. I was on before. I didn't see you, you there. Missed it. I got they enjoyed it. They held him to task for the second law of thermodynamics and entropy being a law. He said entropy is not a law. And then in his first, I think in a first sentence or second sentence, he goes, the entropy laws. 
<laughs> I'm at <laughs> yeah, <wow. it> did. <laughs> Everyone got it to him. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Too funny. Well, it's funny, but it's also weird because it's probably 12 months, maybe 18 months ago, it might even be two years ago. Uh, Rumpus stated the following. Air is not the atmosphere. Now, two years down the line, we're arguing with fundies about how the atmosphere isn't the same as having gas pressure. And his statement, which we all laughed heartily about, became part of the rhetoric. And then the second law of thermodynamics is not entropy. Is, again, something that we're having to lay down bets because they're literally having to fight that. They're having to fragment this law of nature because their sky vacuum stands in violation of it so what what are they going to do they're going to get around the violation of a natural no well now it's time to convolute what the natural law is and argue about that indefinitely not about how the gas would fill the space if the sky was a vacuum no argue about what the second law and entropy are because they're different oh no they're not different uh, well, are we arguing about whether or not the skies vacuum anymore? No, we're not. So, excellent tactics. That's all they've got because they lose the argument based on this natural law. So they just have to convolute the law. That's the only rebuttal they've got. An obfuscation tactic. Yep. It's all Zanic, Rumpus. That's all they got. I told the Zanic that yesterday. Yo, you're like a you're like a used globe salesman. Like <laughs> <He's globe salesman>. <laughs> <laughs> Neil, the next time Zanuck uh, tries something like that with you, ask him to support his claim, and the support cannot have begging the question within it. So it can't pre assume that the earth is turning. I was trying to do that yesterday, I was told to shut up. <laughs> Zanuck will say anything, remember? Remember that. Zanik will say anything at any point. He has no scruples. There's no lawyer he won't tell. But that's fine. Just let him talk and he'll destroy his own argument. Yeah, like like yeah. Huey just said, he literally was ex describing how entropy is not the second law. And maybe two sentences in, he said, oh, yeah, the entropy laws. And you know how he speaks all fast and like, you know, like a like a used car salesman. That's why I call him the used globe salesman. I mean, it's just <laughs> chocolate. The penny's just, the penny's just dropped to what Neil's talking about. So I think I figured out what you were saying. You were trying to get it across in the pre-show, and I didn't quite understand. Now I do, I think, Neil. What you're saying is other, other people, because this was boiled down to the show format in the pre-show, and I was like, okay, this is about how the show is run. It isn't. You're talking about debating styles and debating understanding, because you're saying that while you were trying to point this out, you were shut down on account of the fact that it was it was to other people's untrained in debate ears unreasonable to shut an argument down at the point that they beg the question which is immediately because they're not getting to give the full example it's just being challenged based on the begging the question fallacy which is always very early on now that's intentional on their part they'll slot in their begging the question fallacy normally within their opening breath and the reason they do that is because unless you catch it immediately in which case you've got to interrupt them which they can then class as unreasonable and discuss the interruption instead of the fact that you've pointed out they're begging the question. They get to take you on a dance with a little bit of NLP, a little bit of programming, which is to say that once you've got that opening statement fixed in your brain as the listener, you're then getting a just-so story with the premise firmly established at the beginning of the story, which is Earth is a sphere in every example. So if the Earth's a sphere... You're going to go to the bottom of that sphere and you're going to observe how the lights in the sky turn around the bottom of that sphere. Now, they don't reiterate it overtly like I've just done. They just drop it in once really fast. And then if you don't catch it, you're allowing them to beg the question. Now, somebody who's adept at the debate process like Anthony Riley. Now, he was in the conversation. Otherwise, he'd have probably got listed first as excellent debater. He is. Now, while I get frustrated with him allowing people to beg the question, he's got a motivation behind it. He's giving them a noose to hang themselves with. Not just going, yeah, okay, just let them beg the question because they don't, half the time, the other debaters who are less experienced don't even realise that that's what's being done. And I think that's what Neil's point is. Am I right? Correct.
Neil, if he wants to add the conservation of momentum to the Coriolis effect or any other nonsense claim like that, what you say to him is, show me uh, an example of the Coriolis effect that doesn't involve the earth turn, earth turn or the physical earth, just a different example, and then show him, uh, ask him to support how the, Cori uh, the conservation of momentum has anything to do with that. Give him the example of a child, or, uh, uh, sorry, a children's roundabout, something like that. He won't be able to support it. I see that as the, the great diversionary tactic right there. I Meanwhile, you, you know, you're asking about Coriolis, which is the observation from the non-inertial reference frame, right? And then he was to talk about con conserving momentum. Well, what's conserving the momentum? The projectile that you're looking at? That, what does that have to do with with you <laughs> being on the non-inertial reference frame? What, what what does that have to do with anything? And and they're so like Zanuck especially is so good at just putting that wall in front of people's eyes that they can't see it. And when you once you pick it apart and you hear it, it's like, oh yeah, all right, <laughs> you're not falling. We're not falling for the banana in the tailpipe again. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, spot on chocolate. You know who, who cemented this for me? Zanuck himself. Because he made it absolutely plain. You can't have Coriolis effect. It's always going to be from the non-inertial reference frame while I'm detailing me getting on and off a pendulum. Now, in my example, being Miley effing Cyrus, I am the projectile. Well, me changing reference frames has nothing to do with Coriolis. Can I change reference frame? Was my point valid? Is that absolutely correct? Yeah, I can change reference frames. I can do that. Is it an observation from a non-inertial spinning reference frame, as I asked you earlier? No. So it's not Coriolis. And Zanuck was quick to point that out to me. And I was like, hang on a second. You're right. All Coriolis examples are only ever taking place from a spinning reference frame that you're on observing something. It doesn't matter if that thing that you're observing is concrete in the ground, seeming to drift because you're spinning, or travelling at high velocity, seeming to curve because you're spinning underneath it, or doing loop-de-loops in the sky whilst retaining and increasing its velocity and momentum. What you're observing of it is it seeming to drift. Regardless of if it's increasing speed, decreasing speed, doing loop-de-loops, it makes absolutely no difference. What you are doing is looking at it and going, oh, it looks like it's drifting when it's not. That's it. So anything outside of that, like what a bullet does, like what a plane does because it's got an engine, well, that's not me observing it from a spinning reference frame. So who cares whether it's got engines? doesn't matter if it's a kite that's held onto the ground by a piece of string. If you're on a roundabout looking at that kite and you go, wow, it looks like it's curving away from me. Well, it isn't. It's attached to the ground with a piece of string. But you're spinning, so it looks like it's doing something it isn't. And that's all Coriolis ever will be. But what do they detail? Well, they detail the plane having engines. So it's compensating for the Coriolis effect. No, it isn't. That's nothing to do with Coriolis effect. Because the Coriolis effect is you observing it while spinning. That's it. Exactly, Neil. Listen to Nathan. Uh, ask any of them who want to challenge you to prove that the Coriolis effect is not just a, vi a visual effect. They won't be able to do it. Well, Zanuck, a couple of times when he tried to define Coriolis effect, he, he ended it with, well, it's reference frame dependent. Okay. That, that would make it an observation. Right. So how again? How does an observation create a storm? <laughs> yeah, my question is: How can an observation cause something to occur? Yeah, pretty much the same question. <laughs> I'm so, I'm starting to like the Coriolis argument because the more we talk about it, the more concise it gets the quicker we get to describing what's occurring and the quicker we can pull apart a claim with a few choice questions and the quicker that gets i remember a year ago going yeah at the moment when i'm trimming out these coriolis arguments they're an hour and 20 minutes to get to a conclusion and then it was down to half an hour 
then it was down to 20 minutes, then it was down to 10. Now I reckon we can wrap up a Coriolis argument about two minutes flat. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Well, the top three doesn't even have gravity. Notice the third is Coriolis. Or or lack thereof. Correct. Because, because that's the reason why these clowns, especially like people like Zanuck, would say, oh, well, conservation of momentum. When we ask, why is the helicopter not deviating when it's hovering above the ground? <laughs> oh, it's, it's conserving momentum. <laughs> Really? Well, that's why I've always liked Coriolis, because it's so easy. Uh, now, when they try to take you to the other things, you just don't let them. <laughs> it stays easy, because they have to change the subject to keep the argument going. We need to change that question, Chocolate. Why is the helicopter not demonstrating proof of Earth turn in the form of a Coriolis deflection? Huh. I like that. <laughs> a little bit more detail, but yeah, I like it. Because you're tying them into the... If they say, well, it's not proving Earth spinning because it's conserving momentum. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> what? That's stupidity. Wait. Speaking of stupidity, wait till you see the retard manifesto today. You want to talk about stupid. And I got a special bonus. The Lord was looking down on me and say and blessed me because an Orthodox, I finally found out that an Orthodox authored this, put this in Gem Panda server. All the ballers are falling all over it, right? You know, fawning over it. And then I got a special bonus that the photosynthetic redneck got a hold of it and he made a video on it. So somebody loves me up there. Wait, do you see this? He's considered. You're not going to believe it. Considered one of their top debaters, you know. What's that? Say again. Can someone fill him in? Redneck retards considered one of their top debaters, you know. Yeah. He is. Uh, no. What's What's happening, QE? <laughs> oh hang my on, God! <laughs> hang on, QE. There's a. Two man team or man woman, it doesn't matter, uh, of the best ballers and the best flat earthers. And who would be the best two on two debate team? So, Emma, UK, Bev, and everybody were asking this question. The ballers picked their twos, all these different you know groups of two. And then they, on our side, we said Nathan and you know QE are the best that we have. And so they're trying to see who the ballers would say would stand up against you guys. So that's what that's about. Uh, <laughs> right. I'm not even going to say anything. Well, that's the whole point. We want to see who they think. Obviously, all these people being grouped together for baller twos have already been beaten so many times. It's, it's funny to even think about it. Who's rustling in G plus? That you are in. Is that QE? Oh, yes. Yeah, don't charge me with rustling. <laughs> hey, stop it! <laughs> Got to put a headphone warning now in the in the premiering trap. Oh, sorry. Kiwi, were you there yesterday with Rumpus? Uh, I don't think so. What do you say now? 27 times calling you scared, calling Nathan a scaredy cat. Oh, <laughs> I, I heard that. Go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's... Now you, you should edit that together with the time when he was going mute, 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 mute. With the meow, 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 meow. Exactly. And then scaredy cat, <laughs> scaredy cat. <laughs> Oh, that was good. Deep. We had a Highlander after getting the breakdown of why that was done. Yep. Oh, I put a little thing on Spider Daddy. 
I, I did it late last night and I sent it out. Did you guys hear that? Just a little, just a small one. No, but I know he retracted on everything. No, I, I didn't listen to it yet. No. Is the, is the Spider Daddy segment on the web? So, no, Spider Daddy. It's just a little one. It's in Ball Busters. It's just a couple. It's just like 30 or 35 <laughs> seconds. It's not long. Okay, so mass is literally just how heavy something is. That's weight. How heavy something is? Weight. That's not mass. Well, of course it's not mass. Okay, so mass is literally just how heavy something is. That's weight. How heavy something is? Weight. That's not mass. Well, of course it's not mass. <laughs> well, of course it's not mass. <laughs> so what's mass? Of course it's not. So what's mass? What? <laughs> well, how heavy something is, is this weight, That's weight. inserted on the That's floor. That's weight. That's yeah. weight, isn't it? That's not mass. You've just said it. You even just said a moment ago, like literally 25 seconds ago. Well, no, that's not mass. Yeah. So what is mass? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That yeah. reminds me of a movie. <laughs> that was funny. I, I don't know which one. Wait, you go no, I, I, I don't know. That know. Spider Daddy episode was one of the best in uh, months, I would say. It's because he he had a moment of contemplation in the, in that in that recording. I put it out as uh, the recording was called, or the, the trimmed clip was called. When the penny drops, space is fake, or when the penny drops, outer space is fake, to be more accurate. But the contemplation moment is glorious. Yeah, you so should you have know, heard him. The he next was on Discord day. the other day in saying. Hang on. He was on Discord the other day saying that, that he was just doing that to move the conversation along, so it wasn't really genuine, just so you know. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> yeah. It was recorded, so I don't care what he says in the aftermath. What I, <laughs> yeah. what I explained to him was that when he was like, well, is the air infinite? Now, there's two choices for me at that moment. Do I say, well, no, we've got gas cycles and it's general... No, no. It's like, no, what you've just conceded is that space is fake and cannot possibly exist by way of natural law. Now, we dwelled on that for enough time for him to appreciate that that's how it is. But then I explained to him that you're just now like us, open to ridicule, because you've recognised reality, and it's not conforming with the fundies you are around. So all of those people around you still think they're on a globe. See that it's perfectly acceptable to ridicule you because you've had an eye-opening moment and realised that space is fake. So not, well, suddenly I, I must have my questions answered because I've realised that space is fake. No, suddenly that doesn't mean you're enlightened in terms of the view of the general public. It means you're fair game to be ridiculed and that means regression. So not, oh no, that's very depressing, one of the worldviews I held, space, is now not real anymore because that will take you into depression. So what did he do? He regressed. We see it every day. So he what, went back on his word and denied that what he'd contemplated and realised beyond all reasonable certitude was not actually beyond all reasonable doubt. Actually, natural law could be violated by gravity that's not a force because his fundy belief is strong. That's all it is. So a regression to denial. Wow. <laughs> that's surprising they all do it i yeah. i kind of recall him saying on that show nathan nathan i just i research everything i don't believe everything that th about things that you know people show me i research everything hey nathan what you described the uh, regression and then progression isn't it basically the ebb and flow of beliefs it's the ebb and flow between the five stages of loss the loss yeah. being their religious worldview that they're on a ball. This is why it's top three, not gravity, right? On a ball, yeah, what debunks that, Black Swan? In a sky vacuum, what debunks that? Well, gas pressure that we've got. And spinning, well, what debunks that? Well, Coriolis effect, we haven't got any. It's real, but we don't see it. So those are the three that they assert as their religious foundations. Gravity is not part of that foundation. It's just a tack on bullshit conceptualization to square a few circles when there's enough convolution between the 100 year out of date bit and the current out of date bit that doesn't conform with quantum mechanics well that is useful enough to patch a few holes in a, a ship that's sinking 
temporarily for those who are watching it and taking photographs from the shoreline that don't realize there's a whole bunch of men having to keep those patches constantly patched over as we we pull them off <laughs> you know go no no this is a gaping hole in the boat this is <laughs> no 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 gravity's actually a force you can think of it as a force as they sellotape over again the hole they, they remind me of the band in uh, titanic that's still playing as it's going down <laughs> yeah nothing to see here business as usual Force gravity right so when there's a hole in the boat and the boat is in the water then relative density will make the water come into the boat and want to go up thank you arwin for convoluting this beautiful point so eloquently <laughs> sorry <laughs> And then the balls would will argue, no, 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 it's only gravity pushing it all down. So the water's not going to come through the hole into the boat because gravity's that's only pushing it down. Yeah, that's the that's, billboard. That mostly the, that's the words on the billboard that they pass, plaster over the hole for us on the inside of the ship. <laughs> exactly. But it's just a paper billboard. It's not going to increase the structural rigidity that's sinking. Just a temporary fix so that we walk past as we walk through that particular area of the sinking ship. And go, hang on, that looks like a poster over a hole. <laughs> <laughs> Your man spoiler that he, he, he came in and he showed he didn't know what he was talking about. And then he went off and proved that he was a lawyer. I mean... That's phenomenal. Uh, to do that to yourself yeah. in one day or yeah. one week. He's, he's yeah. in cognitive They're pain all liars, now, right? Did you, hey, uh, Nathan, hold on, did hold on, you hold listen? Hold on. He's in cognitive okay. pain now. So he's <clears throat> the person he's lying to is himself. So when we talk about the people who perpetuate the lie, well, he is. He's the guy doing it. Well, at, at some point, he has to make a choice to accept reality or not. Now, if it's right. conformity that he wants, he's got to lie to himself. That's painful cognitively. That's why we say so often, share your pain. Well, him, his regression isn't the right way. In terms of loss, which way you've got to go? Well, you've got to go through depression to get to acceptance. Not denial, <laughs> but that's stepping backwards. That ain't going to help him. It's going to leave him in pain, which will probably express itself in the first stage. Anger, or second stage, actually. Denial is the first stage. But yeah, yeah okay. denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Right, so they're in cognitive pain. So yes. give them a cognitive break already. Why? They're in pain, give them a break. Well, they're in cognitive pain, so give them their cognitive break. It's. I'll give them, I'll give them two 500 milligram Advils. How's that? They're going to need more than that. <laughs> 20 grams of memories if they want it 20 grams of memories well what i was going to say is i thought dell uh uh last week or the week before summarized the si situation eloquently i put that tape out. did you get a chance to listen to that nathan no but i'll play it if you can tell me where it is i'll tell you what um uh, give me one moment it's got a couple f-bombs you know it, from Dow, but it's it, it it was a good little rant. I liked it. <laughs> yeah, get, wait one second. I'll is put it, it where you at, uh, Ballbusters. Yeah, is it this Dean dipshit? Say again, one blade. No, dip. not Dean dipshit. No, okay. Hold on a sec. I'll put it in Ballbusters. Give me a moment. No worries. While you're doing that, so this is uh, going to be a clip from Beyond the Imaginary Curve. That's the name of the YouTube channel. And uh, the host of the show is called Dell. So that's who we're referring to when we say Dell said this, Dell said that. But yeah, check him out. Be here or be sphere for beyond the imaginary curve. Hopefully I've bought hey, go, found it. Dell. Light bulb. Is that the one? No, not Dell light bulb. No. That's, that's a different one. Here oh, it, here it comes. Give a second. There you go. Got, got it. Every one of these cunts have got to misrepresent you to try and make what you stand for weaker because they're spineless and they're part of a fucking idiotic religious cult that's crumbling right in front of you. 
They can't deal with it. So they've got to come and attack straw man gibberish and misrepresent you left, right and fucking centre. Because they're scared. Scared, snivelling little fucking rodents, scurrying about and all the shite. All the piss and shite scurrying about and I want to protect my shite and piss. Fuck off. Can stamp on you, squish you like a fucking rodent and pest that you actually are. He said, of over five fucking years to provide anything. He's, the, the globe cult don't even have a representative that's got the ability to have a reasonable discussion. Not one globe believer has came on this channel that has been reasonable, ready to have an open discussion and display integrity and honesty. Not fucking one. But yeah, they want to come here shitting all our verbal diarrhea all over us. Talking utter shite. Telling fucking lies. It's very, very, very hard not to wish these motherfuckers the fucking world of fucking pain, torture and torment because they fucking deserve it. People like me appeared here on this scene with honesty, ready to have that discussion. And from the very beginning, all I've had is liars. People willing to misrepresent, make propaganda, hit pieces on you, focusing on you, the man, constantly trying to tear strips, sow faulty seeds of perception in other people's minds. Devious, scummy, little fucking rodents is what they are. This globe cult is a vile, putrid, horrible cunt. The sooner it crumbles and these motherfuckers are outed, the better. I've always had a content and a distaste for this fucking place. And it's not getting any weaker. It's not getting any weaker. You know why? Because the more the years go on, it's becoming ever more apparent what's actually going on here. I will never bow down to this shithole. I will never conform. I will never bend to any cunt's will and authority. You can fuck all the way off, and when you get there, you can fuck off even further. So take your wee pseudoscience cult of fucking stupidity and ram it right into you. Same problems I've always had a bother with all this apathy. Oh, but you just be nice to them, just see. Fuck that! Draw a fucking line in the sand. This is again this stupidity in people that they don't think there's an actual war happening here. It's not a war that you sit and watch on your telly, black and white people in muddy fields with guns. You identify them by their walk. Not their robe, not their hairstyle, their skin colour, their tattoos. I, Quantum Eraser, fully concur and approve this message. And with that, I'm going to say a huge, massive, enormous thank you to both Discord and G Plus Pals for making today's after show possible and of course a massive thank you to both or all of you in the uh, premium stream audience for hopefully liking commenting sharing subscribing and all that good i've been nathan oakley and i'll see you all in the next video Lovely day!